American cities are doing boulevards with new light rail projects that are unlocking the land and enabling them to happen. But they're also doing quite a bit of other rail projects now because many of the American cities didn't have the fundamental structures that enable you to live without a car and to move around in their corridors uh, without needing to have massive highways. So that process is happening, but the interesting part about it is that there is a return to the private funding and involvement in partnerships. So this cuts across all of the things we're talking about, that partnership approach, so that you can get land uh, developed, redeveloped, uh, reurbanization occurring that can uh, be a major part of the economics of these projects. So Sebastian David Slate did his PhD on that kind of topic, um, particularly the entrepreneurial rail model, as we called it. Um, and he is now working in WOLGA, WA Local Government Association, uh, on transport issues. So um, he's continued to have an interest in how we do these projects so that we can involve local government and private sector and communities developing their cities in ways that bring the qualities and values of a 21st century boulevard. Over to you, Sebastian. I'll be talking today about transit activated corridors and in particular the history and some of the more recent practice in North America. Railway has a, a long history of enabling settlement and development in, in North America. In particular, the land grant railways were a very common mechanism for achieving the government's development objectives. For example, the United States government operated a land grant scheme between 1855 and 1871 and they gave millions of acres of land to the, the railway companies to, to extend their lines and to build new towns and to open up farmland, which was then connected into the cities. The ratio of land to rail was 12,000 acres. So for every mile of track that was built by the company, they would receive 12,000 acres of land. And it's quite interesting, that ratio seems to crop up in other places as well. We had uh, a similar project here in Western Australia and it was that same ratio. 12,000 acres of land to one mile of railway. Um, fairly unique circumstances under which that model was employed. Uh, this was during colonial times and uh, there was land which was considered vacant. Of course, today we would be a little bit more conscious about the traditional landowners, but in those days it was very much about bringing undeveloped vacant wilderness land under cultivation and even industrial development. Similar system was employed in Canada. The Canadian Pacific Railway was instrumental in settling the Canadian West and something in the order of 25 million acres of land was granted to the railway company by the government, which is a number that's a little bit hard to quite wrap your head around. This land was then sold on to settlers, farmers and also people settling in new towns. and. The company also actively campaigned and advertised for these settlers in other parts of the British Empire. Colonisation was something of an early public-private partnership to use contemporary terminology. There were also a number of private initiatives. A notable one, which I'll come back to a little bit later, was in Miami. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Henry Flagler founded a company and was, was really instrumental in, in the settlement of, of that state in the, the eastern part of, of Florida. The, the image I've, I've got there is of a hotel that he developed. That's the Hotel Royal Poinciana. And that was an 1150 room hotel. So a substantial development even by today's terms. In addition to inner city railways, there were, all, were also streetcar developments outside a number of American cities. These were mostly private operators developing these. Uh, they would build new uh, streetcar lines and that would extend the existing walking city. It was also a mechanism for 
marketing land and that was the often the primary objective of these proponents was to to sell real estate and the the streetcar was a way to to facilitate that now the railway industry has had something of a, a bad century to quote warren buffett but it is beginning to come back and light rail in particular has become, become quite prominent in the the regeneration of cities in north america the the photo i have here is of the valley line in Edmonton in Canada. Now this was a, a line that was delivered by a, a public-private partnership, so a consortium called TransEd, which is made up of primarily Bechtel and Bombardier, were contracted to build a 13 kilometer light rail line. And they were responsible for the design and for the operation over a 30 year period. And critically, a lot of the construction risk was transferred to the, the private proponent. This was, this was one of the initial benefits of the, the public-private partnership model was that this commercial type of risk was transferred from the government, which is not so good at managing this type of thing, to a private proponent who is, who is better able to control for those sorts of factors. Another great example is the South Lake Union Streetcar in Seattle. Now this project was initiated by com community and business interests in the area. It was very much a, a bottom-up project and then it was intended to promote urban renewal in, in the area that it was built. Now the way it was funded was quite interesting. There was a fee applied to 760 parcels of land within this area um, and this raised approximately 52% of the cost of developing the project, so, so quite significant. The, the remainder came from um, government, government funding from various levels. Now of these 760 land parcels, only 12 of the landowners objected to this new imposition to pay for the infrastructure. So as a, as a whole, the landowners in the area were clearly aware of the, the regeneration potential of this project and were very much on, on board with it. The, uh, once this had been agreed to, the city of Seattle raised bonds and the the funds from these land parcels from this fee was connected to those bonds as a way of paying them back. An interesting little feature of this was that the landowners had an option about paying their part of the fee upfront or in 18 years time at a 4.4% interest rate. This was presumably to, uh, to allow for cash flow considerations of some of these landowners who perhaps couldn't have come up with the cash as it was required to develop the project but did want to be part of this development. And this is, was called a, a local improvement district, this, this method of financing and funding the, the infrastructure and similar schemes are also referred to as a business improvement district or a special improvement district, but it's all more or less the same sort of concept. Now this streetcar began operation in 2007, so it's, it's been around for some time now. Next. And this is on a, a different scale altogether, the Miami Bright Line. Now this is a, a fully private railway project. It was financed through a, a hedge fund based in New York. And it's, it's very interesting who the proponent is in this case. I mentioned previously the development in Florida by uh, Mr. Mr. Henry Flagler. Now his company, it never, never went out of business. It's still in operation and it is the exact same company as has developed the Bright Line Railway. Now they got out of the railway business many years ago and just focused on real estate development, but they retained the rail right of way and this was remediated to allow for modern rolling stock to, to travel along it at higher speeds. The image that I've got there, that's from their downtown Miami station and you'll, you'll notice the, the new looking buildings in the background there. Those buildings were developed by the company. It's a, a mixed use development. There's offices, retail, a hotel, some residential apartments, mixed use in the, the planning terms. And they have a couple of other stations. The, the end one is at Fort Lauderdale and they've got some land around there which they are also developing. This project has been quite successful and they, ha they are in the process of extending it. The first stage of the extensions is to build a line up to Orlando International Airport, which is a distance of an additional 235 miles or approximately 380 kilometers. Now this is completely new track. The, the first stage of the project was rehabilitating historical railways, so much cheaper. But obviously now that they've, 
establish their operations, they're feeling confident that they can invest the money necessary to build completely new modern railway infrastructure. So it's, it's quite an exciting prospect. Um, they are also planning to extend from Orlando through to Tampa on the west coast of Florida. And as a, an interesting little note there, one of their stops will be at Disney World. And I would very much love to know what the contractual arrangements were there between Brightline and Disney. There would have been something pretty interesting, I'm sure, but it will be confidential, of course. Um, they have also extended to the west coast of the United States. They are in the process of planning for a line from Los Angeles to Las Vegas. Um, a lot of people travel between those two cities, um, presumably mostly people going to Las Vegas for a holiday to, to gamble in some of the casinos, and, and Brightline expects to capture approximately 10% of those, of those trips. It's quite interesting how this project has evolved. Initially, it wasn't going to go all the way into Los Angeles. It was going to run from Las Vegas to a, a very small town outside of Los Angeles called Victorville. Um, obviously, they've continued to work on that because more recently they've released maps showing connections to the LA metro system. And I, I don't fully understand how that network all ties together, but they have connected in, in some way. So a, a means has been found and I've got no doubt that they do own quite a bit of land around Victorville, which probably was the, the impetus for developing in that location in the first place. Although they tend to keep that sort of thing a little bit quiet. It's uh, not, not trumpeted to the rooftops so much. Now, as a result of these two projects, Brightline have come across a model that possibly is more broadly repeatable across the United States and, and the rest of the world. They have a a slogan, too far to drive and too short to fly. If the distance is too long, they can't complete, compete with airlines because of the higher speed that a, a plane travels once it's in the air. And if it's too short, well, it's easier for people just to drive. And in, in the United States, car ownership is very high. Most people have a car. If there's reasonably priced parking, they can just drive. And there's very high quality road infrastructure to take them there. If it's just a little bit too far, if it's a bit of a long, arduous drive, then people will consider railways. And that is the, that's at the core of, of that, that business model. And they are looking at other potential city pairs across the, the country. Um, so we may see more popping up, none announced yet, but definitely watch this space. I think this, this motto of too far to drive as well, it could be quite interesting in the way that it's applied in other countries as well, and in particular in, in less developed countries where the highway system hasn't been developed to the standards of, for example, the American interstate system. Too far to drive is a very different concept when you, uh, you don't have good quality high-speed roads leading to, to most parts of the country. So potentially much closer city pairs might still be too far to drive in a, a different country. Finally, a more recent uh, case study along a similar line to Brightline is the Texas Central Railway. Now, this is a proposed line between Dallas and Houston in Texas. Um, they've looked at a few different corridors. Gaining, gaining access to a right of way has been a, a bit of work for them, um, but they are well progressed on that. And once again, they're not talking about land development opportunities, but it would be hard to imagine that they wouldn't have some, some parcels of land where they can drop a stop and build potentially a whole new town or a new city centered around their infrastructure. Um, it's quite an international undertaking, the Texas Central Railway. They're using the Japanese bullet trains as their rolling stock, and these vehicles can travel with a maximum speed of 300 kilometers an hour or approximately 185 miles per hour, so, so pretty quick. Um, in addition to the Japanese rolling stock, a Spanish company, Renfe Operadora, is being brought in as the operating partner. So it's, it's very much a, a mixture of, of international expertise, and that, that probably reflects the, the bad century in the railway business in the United States. That sort of capacity has probably been degraded a bit over time. Interestingly, Bechtel are involved in this one as well. They were, they were also involved in the Valley Line in Edmonton. So they're clearly building a bit of expertise in the project management space for these types of projects. 
Now this, this project is a particularly interesting one to watch because land use regulations are, are a bit looser in, in Texas than in many other parts of the, the United States. And in particular, Houston is famous for never having adopted zoning. So we could see some pretty interesting things uh, coming out of the ground if, if this railway can, can be brought to fruition. All in all, it's quite an exciting time for railways at the moment. The rail renaissance is very much underway across the world, both in the developed world and in developing countries as well. There is increased scope for private involvement as well, and this is beginning to be recognised, as is the urban regeneration potential of rail, both light rail and intercity heavy rail. I expect that we will see a lot more of these sorts of projects in the coming years. Thank you, Sebastian. The um, land development opportunities that have to be done in partnership with the private sector uh, if railways are to have a renaissance in America. And I would say it's a very important model for places like Australia. Certainly the Japanese have gone this way. Perhaps you could quickly say something about that. And I've heard that a lot of the Chinese metro systems have been built with private sector involvement, building those uh, like we saw in Guangzhou, the, um, that, that was a private developer came in. So they've done it even in China. So tell us a little bit more about that in Japan in particular. Mm -hmm. Well, the Japanese are really the masters of this, this model of development. Um, all through, particularly the early part of the, the 20th century, the, the Japanese railway companies were very adept at assembling land on the outs, outskirts of the major cities, um, particularly Osaka, where it began, and also in Tokyo. Now, the, the really distinctive part of the Japanese model is, is what's called land readjustment. Now, this land wasn't, wasn't vacant. There were farmers, mostly, already in occupation on this land, and they had to be brought in as key stakeholders. And the way that would be done is that a local committee would be formed and the existing landowners would donate their land to the, the joint enterprise. The railway company would build the infrastructure, uh, both the rail, also local roads, lighting and so forth. And then they would return a portion of the land to each of the landowners. And then that land would, despite being smaller in size than what they gave up, would be worth more because of the new infrastructure. It could be um, sold for private development, for residential and commercial development. Um, Critically as well, these landowners got to have a say on the, the overall vision for the development. Um, a lot of these were effectively master planned communities. And as, as local stakeholders, obviously these people would have had views about how they wanted their area to develop and they were very much brought into the tent and empowered in the process. It wasn't dictated to them from above and they weren't simply bought out. They were part of the process. Um, Another really interesting thing about the Japanese model is the way that they have managed passenger flows. It's, it's an almost universal problem that transit systems tend to have what's known as tidal flows of passengers. Everyone goes into the city centre in the morning to work and then comes out again in the evening. And that's when there's the greatest stress on the system and obviously often a lot less people using it outside of those times. So to try to manage that, the companies worked very hard to attract large institutional uses to the far ends of their lines, for example, university campuses or hospitals. They would often offer cheap land to these, these large institutional uses to try to drive patronage in the opposite direction, which is effectively free capacity. So it's, it costs them almost nothing to move people in the opposite direction from the main flow of the people. And so that's that helps make the just the transport operations, aside from the land development, more financially solvent. Hmm. Um, now, that uh, Miami amazing hotel, that was right next to the railway that was uh, part of uh, Henry Flugler's um, master plan. Um, and that continues for the new Bright Line and presumably the other projects you mentioned in LA to Las Vegas and uh, the Texan projects, they build right next to the train stations and that's part of the partnership they bring. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um, for those sorts of developments to work, it really imposes a bit of a discipline in terms of building more transit-oriented 
types of developments. Um, if your development is too far away from the line, then the, the transport service you're providing is, is virtually useless because people catch their, catch their train to your station and then, well, what do they do from there? They're still not where they need to be. Um, so sort of combining the two, the land development and the transport development into one single enterprise is, is very good for coordinating the two, something that often is, is struggled with, in, um, particularly in the English-speaking world, I think. So in uh, Florida, I did go to the Brightline project before it was finished and talk to the county and local governments there about their involvement in it. They were uh, doing quite a lot on the last mile, first mile linkages, so bus interchanges and small uh, micro mobility things with walking and cycling and so on. Uh, do you find that uh, that element also as part of the integration of the private and public outcomes for a station precinct? I mean, certainly it is, um, it is critical that, that new stations are, are linked in to the, the broader city, the broader transport network. Um, that is done in different, different ways in different places. And potentially it can be done on a quite an informal basis. It's, it's very common in developing world cities for um, micro transit to sort of just pop up as a result of the efforts of a series of, of, of local business people um, operating jitneys or minibuses or, or what have you. Um, that sort of model can be a little bit sort of messy at times, but it is one way to, to do that. But definitely that is a, a critical part of, of this sort of development, that, that first and last mile, as you say. So this model, uh, which incorporates private sector interests and creativity and innovation, uh, it, it would be criticised by many as, as being too uh, easily giving up common good outcomes, which government looks after, in order to bring in this money and you know, their abilities and to attract finance. Um, how, how, how do you deal with that? Uh, is it possible to, the, through the partnerships, to ensure common good outcomes? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, ultimately, government will have control through, for example, land use regulations. Um, government can be a, a party to these, these sorts of developments. And there's, um, there are already very well established mechanisms for private development, partnering with government entities for the common good. Um, to use a, a Western Australian example, we have Development WA, which is the government-owned development agency. It has a, a very well-established model for, for partnering with private interests, um, but still retaining, in con retaining control of the overall vision of the development um, and ensuring that whatever objectives are required for the common good are, are worked into that. Um, one mechanism through which that can be done is through controlling the land and providing the land to the private party as a, a long-term lease. Um, I understand that McDonald's employs a similar method to control its franchisees. The land underneath the restaurant is often controlled by the, um, the franchisor and that's a, a very effective way of, of keeping them in line because if they, if they don't behave themselves well, the lease may not be renewed. Um, so controlling the land, very, very powerful. Mm. So that way of thinking uh, is not very obvious in Australia in general. Uh, and certainly there is apparently no move towards that um, occurring. Do you see that as a problem for the high-speed rail option and the mid-tier transit option, both of which could use land more effectively as your American models have shown. They're both high-speed rail and they're linking into that, that uh, bottom-up process of land development in cities. So together, they seem to be lacking in our cities. Um, and particularly in Perth. Yeah, well, um, I think uh, 
kind of the the mechanism for actually bringing these sorts of projects into into fruition is pretty well understand understood. Um, however, there are always stakeholders, both within government and also the broader community. Um, for example, community attitudes towards higher density development is is often um, it's often looked on a little bit askance. Um, and of course, government is not a single entity with one will. It's a series of different agencies who are all bringing into effect the intent of many different pieces of legislation. Um, it's, it's common in government to talk about silos, working in silos, even within a single agency. It can often be quite challenging to coordinate effectively with, with other people in your own department. Um, so, so that is part of it, I think. Um, in particular, the fact that many of these, many of these entities, as I say, are effectively bringing to life bits of legislation which were passed by different parliaments and sometimes very long ago. Um, in the, the Western Australian example, we have the Main Roads Act, for example, which was passed in 1925. The, uh, the parliament of 1925 is no longer here. We don't know what they would say about how all of the other parts of government are operating or what this agency should be doing in relation to those. Um, but yet this, this document, which has legal power, is still there and still directing how things go. And of course, the agency itself has developed over time. It has its objectives, its accountabilities, which is, I think, often what drives the behaviour of government agencies, what they're, what they're judged for. Um, that's the, and of course, there are a number of other agencies which similarly have their own bits of legislation. We have, we have planning legislation. Um, the Metropolitan Region Scheme was brought in in 1955. Again, the Parliament of 1955 is not here. We don't know what they would think of the outcomes of their, of their piece of legislation if they were here. So it's, it's complicated. The real world is messy, unfortunately. Yes, it's messy, but it needs a vision for the future. And we are going to need high-speed rail or higher-speed rail, at least, going into regional areas. And we are going to need mid-tier transit, which in, in, enables urban regeneration. Both of them, in fact, enable regeneration of land. Um, this model of partnership, where you involve the private sector from the start, it's going to have to be brought in sometime, isn't it? Yes, yes. <laughs> Yes, I think so. And um, coming back to the messiness of, of the real world, uh, once a project has been announced, the people who control the land that is near that, they will be very much aware of how the value of their land has changed. Um, there's been a little bit of push and shove around the airport railway in particular, where um, that continued on past the, past the airport into a, an industrial area and the, the people who owned what were previously warehouse lots suddenly had a bit of land that the government wanted to wanted to have under its control to deliver its vision, but which was suddenly worth an awful lot more than it had been previously. And arguments around what is the appropriate level of compensation are, are the sort of thing that you can expect to see in that regard. Um, unfortunately, we tend to be in the sort of space where private developers in particular tend to be regulated by government rather than able to constructively um, cooperate with government. And uh, I mean, there's, there's a long history behind mm. that. Yeah. Mm. But if we don't overcome that, the land value outcomes are going to disappear because of the difficulties and the lack of zoning or, or something will stop it. But that process will seriously impact on the economy. As Rohit has showed us in his presentation, increasing land value means increasing economic activity. And that is what we need both in our regional centres and in our cities along those corridors that, uh, that need regenerating. So I think what you're saying is a model that is really significantly needing to be addressed at some point in our history. Otherwise, we will uh, not be getting the most out of our transport and land use system. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, if we don't change the way we're doing things, we'll continue to get what we've always got. But our current model of development does have its, its limits. 
roads in particular have a very limited capacity and um, so far in Western Australia we haven't quite reached the point that this has become so acute but in, in other parts of the country it's been very very clear what happens when you start to exceed the capacity of those those transport systems and issues around traffic congestion just for one which is is an enormous um, enormous public policy challenge and an enormous political issue um, disconnection um, and add, add to it the health and climate change issues. And Absolutely. We're pretty much there. Well, thank you, Sebastian. That's really helped us uh, see not just a vision for corridor development, but how to do it. And that whole partnership model is absolutely critical. So thank you. Thank you.